Let's go before the Lord and get into Acts 21 this evening. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the way you love us. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives just over and over and over again. And I pray that, God, as we open up your word tonight, that worship wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop when the songs stop. That worship would continue as we let you speak into our lives and we, we are determined, Lord, to, to be who you've called us to be and do what you've called us to do. So may your Holy Spirit just be present in this season, to be present in this time. God, that we would be more like you by the time we spend here this evening. Again, God, may you fill every home, every place where people are gathered and watching the study right now. May you fill it with your spirit. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you can almost do this for me now, can you? This intro to Acts. I know you are, but the thing I love about it, people, why do you start the same way every time? Because you will never forget it. And you'll forget all kinds of stuff that I talked about in the book of Acts. But 12, 15, 20 years from now, if we're still around, you'll say, oh, Acts, Acts. What about Acts? It was written by, first of all, who? Luke, you remember, same guy that wrote Luke, wrote Acts. He's the only doctor to write a, bi- a book of the Bible in the New Testament, the only Gentile to write a book of the New Testament. And we're so thankful that Dr. Luke did that because the book of Acts is so important. The book of Acts, I think I said Luke, but the book of Acts is the bridge, right? You know this, between the New Testament gospels and the New Testament epistles. Without them, we'd be lost because we'd see Jesus alive. We'd see Jesus about to go to heaven, but then the next chapter would be, I don't know, maybe it would be Thessalonians chapter one. And you'd go, how did the church get to, to this, the, the city of Thessalonica? And how did, how did the church get to Rome? And how did, who's this Paul guy? And why should we trust him? But we don't ask those questions. Why? You know it, because we have the book of Acts. I'm sorry. Yes, Acts. That's why. Now, secondly, the book of Acts is also awesome because it's one of the only books that comes with its own divine outline, right? So it's not me that outlined the book. It's not some pastor that outlined the book. It is Jesus himself that outlined this book. His outline is in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus, right before he ascends into heaven, says to the disciples, but, but the Holy Spirit, but you will be witnesses to me, the scripture says, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts follows that outline exactly. For the first seven chapters, the church is centered in the city of Jerusalem. And then because of persecution under the leadership of men like Philip, the church moves out from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, just like Jesus said it would, to, to, the, to the, the central and southern parts of the nation of Israel. And then, then under the leadership of first Peter and then Paul, the church is going to move far beyond the nation of Israel to the ends of the earth. And we're so thankful for that, right? Because we are, most of us, Gentiles. And I'm so thankful that God loves us enough to graft us into his family and into his tree. And so the story of the gospel spreading out to the Gentiles is what we continue again tonight as Paul is now full circle. The, the, the church started in Jerusalem and now Paul is coming back to Jerusalem. Not to plant any church, that's his mission in the in the gentile nations but he's coming back to jerusalem tonight because number one he wants to be there for the feast of pentecost and then secondly as we'll also look at tonight paul just has a heart to reach his countrymen the jewish people And as we look at the text in front of us tonight, we'll notice five things if you want to write them down and then we'll go through them one at a time. We're first going to see Paul's journey to Jerusalem. Then secondly, we're going to see Paul's compromise in Jerusalem. We looked at that on Sunday, but we'll briefly overview it again tonight. And then we're going to see Paul's wrong identification uh, there in Jerusalem. And then Paul's story of salvation. And finally, Paul's Jewish rejection. The Jewish people reject him. So one at a time, looking at chapter 21, if you would look at it with me. It says there, now it came to pass when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kaz, and the following day to Rhodes, and then there Pantera, or Petera, and finding ships sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left and sailed to, to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there was a ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. And then they told Paul through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem. But when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed, and when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemus and greeted the, the, the brethren and stayed there with them one day. And the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven. And stayed with him. And now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles." Now, when we heard these things, both we and those uh, from that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered and said, why do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying the will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. And also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them the certain Mason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. Remember where we left off a week ago. Last Wednesday night, Paul is trying, as he's finishing up his third missionary journey, he is trying to get back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And so he's kind of rapidly moving from city to city. He gets all the way to Corinth, and he starts to come really back, just spending a few days in each of those towns, Thessalonica, Philippi, Berea, all these towns. Then he goes across, as we saw last Wednesday night, to Troas. And there in Troas, you can see on the next slide there, on Troas... He, he, he preaches all night long. It's his last sermon with these people. He doesn't know if he'll ever see him again. So Paul is in no hurry to stop. He doesn't have an 8 p.m. stop time like I do on a Wednesday night. No, he is just going to keep going and going and going. And he preaches all night. And in the middle of the night, at about midnight, a young man, a junior hire, I feel for this kid. He's there enduring this entire study. He falls asleep and falls out of the three-story window that he was sitting and listening to Paul. <laughs> and, and he dies. And Paul has to go and revive him and bring him back from the dead. And it's just an amazing, amazing miracle. So after Troas, the next they go to Miletus. Paul goes 30 miles south of the city of Ephesus. And the reason for that is... He had pastored there, you remember, for three years. And he knows as the pastor, a ton of people are going to want to talk to him, and he's going to want to talk to a ton of people. And that's awesome, but he will miss the ship heading to Jerusalem, and he's wanting to get to Jerusalem by the Feast of Pentecost. So instead of going to Ephesus directly, he goes 30 miles south, and he calls the elders, the leaders, the pastors of the church of Ephesus, and they go to Miletus, and they have kind of like a, a mini pastor's conference there on the beach. And we went over what Paul told them last Wednesday night. You can get that study online if you missed it. And as Paul sails away, Acts 21 gives us the details of the rest of the journey. They go by roads, as you can see there on the map. Then they go to Patera. Then they make their way past Cyprus. And it says the island was on the left, just like again, it shows on the map right in front of you on the screen. And then they land in the city of Tyre, which is modern day Lebanon, just north of Israel today. And in Tyre, they found Christians and they stayed with them seven days. Then they come to Ptolemais, which is just north of the city of Haifa in Israel today. And finally, they come to their final stop, the main port in Israel in the first century, and that was the city of Caesarea. We'll put a couple of pictures up next. You can see Caesarea in this next photo of what it looks like today. You can actually go and visit Caesarea today. It's one of the, my favorite parts of visiting the nation of Israel. It's a fascinating archaeological find and to be in the actual theater where Paul gave his gift defense that we'll talk about next, next Wednesday night. But then all the things that happened there, just, just amazing to be in that city. But, but to give you a, a kind of a view of what it was like for Paul to be there, we give you this next photo, which is an artist rendering from all the archaeological finds they've had and putting roofs and structure to them, what Caesarea would have looked like, this port city there in the northern part of the nation of Israel. And it was, it was the political capital of Rome 
in the, the nation of Israel. The Jews always have seen their capital as Jerusalem, but, but foreign governments, as we did till fairly recently, all the foreign governments have, their, have their, their center of power. Today it's in Tel Aviv, but in the, in the first century it was no different. They had their center of power in Caesarea. That's where the Roman governor would live for most of the year, except during the religious feasts, when he would make his way to Jerusalem with thousands of Roman soldiers to do what? To keep the peace during the feast so there would be no uprising against the nation of Rome that he represented. So Paul docks in Caesarea and goes right away to the home, notice, of Philip the evangelist. Now we're not told anything about what these two talked about, but we're told that number one, Philip has four virgin daughters who prophesied, and then we're told that they stay with him for many days. So the previous place they were at, they, they listed seven days, so this is much longer than a week. They're hanging out, they're having a great time, and what their conversation must have been like, because you see, these two haven't been face to face for at least 20 years. And the first time they met, they met, it was under completely different circumstances. Philip, as, as Luke, Dr. Luke reminds us here, was one of the seven men appointed by the apostles to take care of the Hellenists. That's the, the partially Jew, partially Greek people that lived in Jerusalem at the time to take care of the Hellenistic widows. The story's in Acts chapter 6. If you, you don't remember, you can look back there. But, but, but the, 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 the Hellenist widows felt like they were getting ignored and the Jewish widows were getting taken care of. So the apostles say, we have to give ourselves to prayer and the teaching of the word, but let's appoint seven men who can take care of the Hellenistic widows. And Philip was one of those seven. Another one of those seven was a guy by the name of Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church and no doubt a great friend of Philip. But after the death of Stephen, Philip and many other Christians were chased out of the city of Jerusalem by none other than Saul of Tarshish, who was now called Paul the Apostle, who was sitting across the dinner table from him. What must have that been like? What were their conversations like? No doubt Philip had stayed up on the, the news of what God was doing through the Apostle Paul in the Gentile world with literally thousands of Jews coming to know the Lord, uh, thousands of Gentiles, excuse me, coming to know the Lord. And, and no doubt that was a, a special place in Philip's heart because again, He's a Hellenist, meaning he's got Gentile blood in him, or at the very least, he was originally from a Gentile country. So, so these were his neighbors. These were the people he grew up around, and they're, they're getting saved, and they're giving their lives to, to Jesus the Messiah. I'm sure that blessed Philip so much. But he's still the one that was there approving of the murder of his best friend, Stephen. He was still the one that personally chased Philip and thousands of other Jewish Christians out of Jerusalem, away from their homes, away from their business, and they went to places like Samaria, like Philip did, and eventually Caesarea, penniless. Because of why? Not because of some random reason, because of this man sitting across from him on the table. And I'm sure Philip was gracious to forgive and see the wisdom of God behind it all, using persecution to move the church into Samaria, Judea, and eventually the, the ends of the earth, just like Jesus had said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So I know he forgave him, but imagine these conversations. In verse 10, though, a prophet by the name of Agabus, who came from Jerusalem, comes down to Caesarea, comes to the house of Philip the Evangelist, and he grabs Paul's belt. Hopefully it wasn't on him at the time, but you know, maybe, maybe one that was sitting next to him. And he grabs his belt, and he wraps his hands, and he says, whoever owns this belt, this is what awaits you when you get to Jerusalem. And he says it, not in the flesh, the scripture is very clear. He says it by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is warning through Agabus the prophet, and the same thing happened when he was up in, in Tyre, uh, in, in, in what's Lebanon today, and, and the same thing happened everywhere he went around the, at going home on this last third missionary journey. And, 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 and no doubt, Philip's four daughters gave prophecies of their own, but Paul was determined. 
He was determined to go to Jerusalem. He was determined to reach the Jews. And we see him continue his journey in verse 17. As we saw last Sunday, we see this compromise in Jerusalem. And we just talked about this a few days ago. So I'll be, I'll be brief, but just so we're on the, on the same page. Look at verse 17. It says, And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us, this is, you know, it says us, so Luke is writing, to James and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted them, he told in detail the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to their customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so they may shave their heads that all may know that those things of which we are informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided they should observe no such thing except they should keep themselves from the things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place, and furthermore... He has also brought Greeks into the temple, and he has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, who they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. When all the city was disturbed, the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. As we saw on Sunday, Paul comes to Jerusalem so excited to see his Jewish brothers. And, and, and specifically, his Jewish brothers who, like him, believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He was excited, number one, to share with them the further news that, that God, what God was doing through the Gentiles. You know, again, they didn't live in a world of social media. It wasn't like Paul could be in Ephesus and shoot a video of, of the thousands of Gentiles being saved and send it to Peter and say, hey, Pete, look what's going on in Ephesus. Like, that wasn't the world they lived in. So, so they relied on word of mouth, you know, information, especially for things that weren't world news, like the spread of the church. The world's never been very interested in what the church is doing, except to try to stop it. But anyways, outside of that, so Paul is getting to tell them the full story from, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Sorry, Paul. But just what exactly has been going on in these Gentile nations. So he's excited to give the testimony. And remember, he's got some Gentiles with him. And here they are, men from Ephesus who love Jesus, just just like James and the rest of the, the disciples there in Jerusalem did. And the second reason Paul is excited is he's got a gift from those churches. People weren't just saying, hey, tell the Jews we love them. Like, 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 like just giving them, hey, I'll pray for you, bro. That's not what's going on. These Gentiles had actually parted with their own hard-earned money to say, hey, take this to the believers in Jerusalem who, are, who we've heard are suffering financially and help them out. But, but that's like... <laughs> in a way, one of the purest expressions of love for some of us that we can possibly give is here, I'm gonna part with my money to bless you. And, and Paul is just so excited to say these Gentiles that were once separated from us because they were, they were Gentiles and we are Jews, we're united together in Christ. Paul is so excited. And so he goes and he meets James, who wasn't the apostle James. Remember, he was put to death in chapter 12 of the book of Acts. But this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who is the pastor of the church in Jerusalem there at this time. And he met them with the other leaders. So no doubt some of the other apostles are sitting there as well. And Paul tells them of the great things that God is doing. He, he gives them this, this gift. And, 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 and James just says, oh, praise the Lord. And if the chapter ended there in verse 20, boy, it would be a great chapter. But unfortunately, it goes on for another 20 verses. And what happens next is rather unfortunate because James says, oh, praise the Lord, Paul, but we need to talk. 
And he tells them, there are thousands of Jews who believe in Jesus here in Jerusalem. And as we, we, we mentioned on Sunday, Josephus, a Jewish historian, he isn't a Christian, he isn't trying to promote the Christian cause, he's a Jewish historian. He writes that by 70 AD, there were 100,000 Jewish believers in Jesus that were part of the church in Jerusalem. You heard me right, 100,000. Sometimes we picture the early church as four or five people that only could meet in homes, not because they, they weren't any bigger, but because <laughs> there was only four of them. That's not the, there was 100,000 believers in Jesus in the church in Jerusalem when the city was destroyed in 70 AD. And this is about 14 years before that. This is about, this is about 56 AD. And so no doubt those numbers were getting close to that already in this season. And, and James says there are myriads of Jews who believe, but notice there in verse 20, they're zealous for what? Zealous for Jesus? That's not what James says. Zealous for worship? That's not what James says. Zealous for evangelism? That's not what James says. No, they're zealous for the law. Now, after I taught Sunday, some of you asked, hey, wait, wait, wait a second, how do you know? How do you know they weren't zealous for Jesus? How do you know they weren't zealous for evangelism? Just because he says they're zealous for the law doesn't mean they're not excited about Jesus and evangelism. Well, I don't know for sure, but I can read. And from what I read, James says these myriad of Jews are not blessed by the fact that literally thousands of Gentiles are getting saved. They're not zealous for evangelism. That's clear from what their reaction is to Paul. Secondly, Jesus was obviously blessed with what Paul was doing. So if they were not... They're on a different page than Jesus. So they're not exactly zealous for Jesus. Instead, what were they doing? They were spreading rumors that Paul was teaching those who lived in the Jews who lived in Gentile nations to stop following the law, to stop circumcising their male children, to stop eating kosher. And Paul, when he hears this from James, we've all had this experience. You, someone says, hey, here's what I heard about you. It doesn't just break your heart. You're in a good mood. Something good's been happening in your life. And someone says, hey, you know what I heard? <laughs> and you just go, oh, the wind goes out of your sails. Paul's heart has to break. But his heart specifically is breaking because number one, he's thinking, this is what you're talking about? You're not talking about the thousands of Jews who were on their way to, or sorry, I keep saying Jews, the thousands of Gentiles who were on their way to hell that are now on their way to heaven? That, that's not what you're talking about here in Jerusalem? No, you're talking about something that it also would have broken heart, Paul's heart because it wasn't true. There is no chapter in the Bible where Paul discourages a Jewish man from doing Jewish things like eating kosher, being circumcised, keeping the feast. Paul, Paul never said that. Like I, like I said on Sunday, there is no chapter in the Bible where Paul says, hey, I hear you're a Jew. Have you ever tried bacon? It's so crispy and delicious. <laughs> that's not a chapter in the Bible. And yet that's what they were telling everyone Paul was doing. And it's just ridiculous. Paul had just taken a Nazarite vow. And remember why he's in Jerusalem here in Acts 21. He is trying to be there for the feast. Why? Because the law said he was supposed to be there for the feast. He's, he believes that Jesus is Messiah. He knows what Jesus is, why he's saved. But there's no indication that even Paul left the the, 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 the fulfilling of, of, of the law of God in the Old Testament. So it's all ridiculous. But James and the other leaders, they're convinced if Paul takes these four young Jewish believers in Jesus and pays their vow, they're probably going through a Nazarite vow as well. And it was quite expensive once you got to the temple to offer these sacrifices and go through all the rigmarole they would do in that day in the first century. And, and so they say, hey, Paul, why don't you pay their expenses? So that all the Jews would say, oh, man, what we heard about Paul is ridiculous. He really is a friend of the law. But the only problem with what James and the other leaders are asking Paul to do is when you're dealing with people who are in sin and yes, People who are gossiping are just as much in sin as the people who they are gossiping about, no matter what that person's doing, true or not. Obviously, the sin of gossip is just as serious. And when we're dealing with people who are in sin, they're only going to see what they want to see. And that's exactly what happens in the text. Paul takes these four young men, pays their sacrifices, takes them to the temple, but then we're told Jews from Asia. So who are these? These aren't Jewish believers in Jesus. These are Jews who lived in Asia. Remember, Asia, not 
China or Japan, this is Asia as in Asia Minor, or Ephesus. These are Jews from where Paul had lived for three years. They see him in there with some guys they don't recognize, and they just assume Paul has brought Gentiles into the temple, and they lose their mind because that was, that was, that was greatly forbidden in Jewish culture. In fact, I shared with you on Sunday, they had that sign hanging out the hanging outside of the of the inner court there that said no foreigner or woman may enter within these boundaries which surround this sanctuary. Any who are caught doing so will have themselves to blame for their ensuing death. <laughs> Not exactly seeker friendly, is it? Like we would, we would never in a, in a million years think of hanging something like that outside of our sanctuary. Don't enter if we don't want you here or you're going to die. Like, like they, they were not really into reaching out in that culture. But the rules were clear. And the Romans, who had taken away the right of capital punishment from the Jews, still allowed them to enforce it when people were in their temple or other sacred meeting place. And so the Jews from Asia just assume that Paul has brought the Gentiles into the temple. They cry out, and then it says all the Jews, including, no doubt, some of the members of the church in Jerusalem, well, they act and then ask questions later because This is the lie they've been told and believed about Paul. And because those lies were not put down, they were not refuted by the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, well, therefore, the compromise they asked Paul to participate in, it failed miserably. And they seize Paul, they throw him and the young men out of the temple, and they weren't going to stop there. They start beating them, trying to beat them to death, and that's when the Romans have to get involved. Look at verse 31, and we'll pick up the text. In verse 31, it says, Now, as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. And immediately he took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. Now, when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. Now some among the multitudes cried one thing and some another, and when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob, for the multitude of the people followed after him, crying out, away with him. And then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? And he replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up rebellion and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarshish in Sicilia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. As we have it here, the commander of the garrison hears this riot going on in, in the sanctuary, sanctuary, the, 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 the temple there, the sanctuary of the Temple Mount. And they're there, and, and this guy is a commander of a garrison. So, so you understand, this guy is one of the most influential Roman uh, you know, military leaders in the city. How do we know that? Because the garrison, a Roman garrison, was made up of 10 squads of Roman soldiers that were 100 apiece. So this, was a, this guy was in charge of 1,000 soldiers. We talk a lot about in the New Testament about centurions, those that were in charge of 100 soldiers. This man had 10 centurions under him. So he was one of the most powerful military leaders in the city of Jerusalem at this time. And that means he would have been stationed, we know for sure, in the Antonio Fortress. As the, as the Temple Mount was built there in, in Israel in the first century, they had just to the, the uh, it would be the, the west, the west, the west, the northwest corner of it, they would have this fortress where, where the, the Jewish soldiers and sometimes even the Jewish governor when he was there in Jerusalem would be stationed and they would be kept. And you can see the entire Temple Mount in front of you. And if you can picture on this, if you can kind of imagine in this picture on the screen in front of you, there would be up to 100,000 Jews on this Temple Mount at the same time. Often when, when, the, when the Muslims celebrate Ramadan, they get 70,000, 80,000 Jews on the Temple Mount even today. 
And so it would have less things up there during this time. There could easily be around 100,000 Jews on the Temple Mount at this time. And Paul's just one of those. He's in the group. And yet because of the, the, the tumult that you can see, all of a sudden there's this riot that breaks out. And, and this, is, this is this Roman leader. It's his wheelhouse. He's in Jerusalem. He's stationed on the Antonio Fortress. Why? Because it's his job to stop riots. Why? Because Rome doesn't want any more uprisings from the Jewish people. So when one starts, him and his soldiers jump in and stop it. This is right in his wheelhouse. So they take Paul, they put him in chains, and then they bring him to the Antonio Fortress. And the soldiers try to ask people in the mob what was happening. And they get nowhere because the mob never knows what they're doing. <laughs> that's not a political statement that's just the truth the mob doesn't know why we're here or what we're doing and so the soldiers bring Paul into the Antonio fortress to question him and on the way in Paul asked them in Greek can I talk to you for a minute and Paul speaking Greek to them takes the commander back because the Greek language was for the educated and the cultured men not the common criminals who we assumed Paul to be he assumes, he says there in verse 38, aren't you the Egyptian? We have some historical background on what he's talking about here. Sometimes you just read your Bible and you're like, the Egyptian? Like, who is, who is that? The Egyptian, we, we learn from, from historical sources, was a rebel rouser that a few years back had come from Egypt into Jerusalem. And he led a, a group of assassins called Sakari. And what they would do is they would go into large groups like on that Temple Mount, 100,000 people. And you can, you can imagine, you've been on a busy city street where everybody's kind of just kind of bumping into each other. And what these assassins would do is they'd go up to a Jew or they would go up to a Roman and they would just stab them in the back and then drop the knife and walk away and disappear into the crowd. And he was leading these groups, not just one or two, but a group of assassins that were killing people in mass at these Jewish religious uh, festivals, both Roman people, Roman leaders, Roman, Roman soldiers, and uh, you know, Jewish common people. And so this, this guy, the Egyptian, he leads thousands of them up to the top of, of the Mount of Olives that looks right over the Temple Mount there on the east side of the city of Jerusalem. And he declares that at his word, uh, Jerusalem was going to fall. Well, the Romans sent people out of him. They killed several, several hundred of his followers. But the Egyptian, him itself escaped and he was never found. He was never found. And so the soldiers assume you've got to be him. But Paul says, nope. <laughs> when they see the way the crowd's responding to him, you've got to be this assassin that killed Jewish people. So that's got to be you. And Paul says, nope. But then I love it. He says, but can I address the crowd? <laughs> Look at what Paul tells the crowd. Verse 40. He turns back to the, to the, 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 the people amassed there on the Temple Mount. And he says, so when he had given permission to him, Paul stood on the stairs and he motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they all kept silent. And he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarshish of, uh, of, of Sicily, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you are all today. I persecuted this way to, to the death binding and delivering into prison, notice, both men and women. And also the high priest bears me witness and all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near to Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me and I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered and said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am a Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, arise and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to Damascus. And a certain Ananias, a devout man, look how Paul describes him in verse 12 there. A certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And that same hour I looked up at him. 
And then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it happened when I returned to Jerusalem that I was praying in the temple and I was in a trance and I saw him, that's Jesus, saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And he said to me, depart, for I will send you far away from here to the Gentiles. Paul comes to the Antonio Fortress to address the people. As you can see in the map again in front of you, the Antonio Fortress is up there. Paul's right there. There's a set of stairs that would lead up from the Temple Mount right into the Antonio Fortress. So Paul's right there. So he's standing kind of elevated above the people. They can all see him. They can hear him as he projects over the temple. And he begins to give his testimony to the Jews there on the Temple Mount. He says, I am a Jew. And more than a Jew, I was a leader among you in Judaism. I was brought up in Jerusalem from the structure. He's saying it's most likely from the age of about a junior higher. He was born in Tarshish, but about the age of a junior higher, he came to Jerusalem and was raised here in that place at the feet of Gamaliel. So it's like Paul saying, this is my hood. This is where I grew up. This is, this is where I know that street and that corner and that, that, that baker shop over there. I was taught in the city by Gamaliel, who you remember, the people of the first century didn't just call him a rabbi, they called him Rabon, which was like a rabbi to the rabbis. He was the most respected scholar of the time. And Paul says, I was personally discipled by him. I grew up here. I was taught by the best of the best. I was zealous for the law, just like you guys. Paul doesn't blame them for rioting. He says, I used to be just like you. In fact, Paul goes beyond to say that as much as any of you, I wanted to see the church destroyed. This was Paul's testimony. He held the coats of the people who stoned Stephen, the first martyr, meaning Paul was into and approved or maybe even planned what was happening to Stephen that day. He said he would put Christians in chains. In fact, he was given direction by the Sanhedrin. Paul says, just ask them. I was on their behalf going to Damascus when God confronted me and Paul continues to tell his story that he was knocked over by a bright light and the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and Saul said to him, who are you? What do you want me to do? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Go into Damascus, find a man named Ananias and he will tell you what you are to do. And notice again, verse 12, Paul's very careful to describe Ananias as a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. Paul doesn't describe him as a Christian, which Ananias was, because then the crowd would have shut down and listened no further. Paul describes him as a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with the Jews. Paul isn't lying. He's just emphasizing one part of who Ananias was over the other. And Paul says, that man, that devout Jew, called me brother. And prayed for me and said God had chosen me and that I needed, verse 16, to arise and be baptized and wash away my sins. Now, some people use this verse, Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, there to teach that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, in order for your sins to be washed away. They say, look, it's right there. Arise and be baptized. And then the result of that, your sins will be washed away. So you can pray a prayer. You can walk forward in a sanctuary. But until you are baptized, your sins are not washed away. Someday, someday soon, actually, when we're in the book of 1 Corinthians, we're going to do a whole Sunday morning on whether baptism is essential for salvation. And I think it'll be a really important information study for a lot of you guys to be able to converse with people who, who believe that in a deep way. But sufficient for tonight's study and for you Bible students is to realize that the emphasis of the original Greek text here, it ties the words, wash your sins away, 
and calling on the name of the Lord. It, it links those two things together. In other words, instead of how it reads in English, how it reads in Greek is that your sins are washed away as you call upon the name of the Lord. Paul is not saying here in any way that baptism was what washed his sins away. He is saying that calling on the name of the Lord is what washed his sins away. And again, that's what lines up with everything else we see in the scripture. Paul will tell the Romans, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Again, in Acts 16, believe, Paul tells the Philippian jailer, you remember, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The Bible puts the emphasis on believing in Jesus and confessing your need for him. That is, that is the, the key to washing your sins away. Paul was calling on the name of the Lord. But Ananias calls Paul to put his faith in Jesus and then be baptized. And Paul recounts how then he came back to Jerusalem. He comes back from Damascus all the way to Jerusalem. And while he's praying in the temple, God spoke to him there. Look at verse 18. God told him to get out of this city for the Jews will not receive your testimony. And Paul in verse 9 recounts how he argued with God. Aren't you good to know you're not the only one that does this? <laughs> I get encouraged by the Bible because I do the same things. God speaks to my heart and I'm like, well, Lord, have you considered this? How foolish are we? But we're not alone. The great Paul, the apostle, he, he, he argues with the Lord saying, God, these Jews, they know me. They know my character. I am uniquely situated and trained to reach the Jewish people. God, you got a benefit from my insight, Lord. I'm made to reach the Jews. But verse 21, Paul ends his testimony by saying, but God told me, no, get out of this city and go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Now the crowd up to this point is tracking with Paul. They were no doubt getting to the drama of his life, the different paths he headed down, until he used that word Gentiles. Then the crowd again lost their mind. Look at verse 22. It says, and they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. There's no love for the Gentiles at this time in Jerusalem. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought back into the barracks that he should be examined under scourging so that they might, uh, so, so they might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, and come on, church, that's the English word there. The Greek word is hemos, and it means strips of leather. So don't, don't be thinking about bathing attire here. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't bound him with that. They bound him with strips of leather. But Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it, lawful? is it lawful for you to scourge a man who's a Roman and uncondemned? And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander saying, take care what you do. See, the centurion is being very, very gracious to his commander, but he says, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander said and said, tell me, are you a Roman? And Paul said, yes. And the commander answered and said, with a large sum, I obtained my citizenship. And Paul said, I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman because he had, been, because he had bound him. As we look at the text here, Paul is preaching to the Jews, which he was one. He loved these people. He wanted them to love Jesus. But as soon as he used the word Gentiles, the mob went crazy. Because you see what they're thinking. If God had truly sent Paul to the Gentiles, that put the Gentiles on equal footing with the Jews to the Lord. That God loved them just as much as he loved the Jewish people. And that was something that at that time they were not willing to accept. And so they rioted again. Now, the Roman soldiers don't know what just happened because, remember, Paul is speaking now Hebrew to them instead of Greek that they would have understood. The, the Roman soldiers would have spoke Latin first and foremost, but then also Greek. 
but they bring Paul back in the Antonio Fortress, and now they're going to scourge him to find out what's going on. And remember, this would have been the same thing Jesus endured before he was crucified. They would put your, put your arms around a pole. They would expose your back. They would take that cat of nine tails, little bits of bone and glass, and as it would hit you, it would embed in you and rip out your skin and, and uh, just torture I can't even imagine. That's what Jesus went through. That's what they're threatening to do to Paul. But this is where Paul pulls out the old citizenship card. Paul was a Roman citizen, and you could not scourge an uncondemned Roman citizen. In fact, you could not put a Roman citizen in chains without a trial first. And Paul understood, understandably, not wanting to have his back ripped open with a cat of nine tails, asked the rhetorical question, can you beat an uncondemned Roman citizen? I don't think so. Now the guards are afraid, and they inform the commander, this guy's a Roman. You thought he was an Egyptian? Then you thought he was just a Jew? He's really a Roman citizen. And the commander orders them to stop immediately for if he was responsible for beating a Roman citizen, he would lose his career and maybe even his life. So the commander stops the process and asks, Paul, are, are you really a Roman citizen? By the way, if, if, you, if you told someone you're a Roman citizen and you weren't, it was the death penalty. They were serious about your Roman citizen. It wasn't like, yeah, I'm from Albuquerque when you're really not. It doesn't really matter. It, <laughs> honesty, it does. But, but, but in the Roman world, if you, if you said I'm a Roman and you weren't, mm, and they found that out, you'd be put to death. So he, they would take him at his word at this moment. And, and, the, and, the, and the commander says, I paid for my Roman citizenship. Normally, Roman didn't do that. Roman citizenship was not for sale. You either were or you weren't. But under Emperor Claudius, who was in charge at the time, you could pay corrupt Roman officials and buy your citizenship at a great cost. And Paul makes the statement that he was born a citizen. He was born a citizen. And this, again, is just the sovereign hand of God who created Paul to be just who he was. This immediately stops the proceedings and leads to what we'll discover what happens next. Next week, Paul is, is going to you know, not just stand before the Jews in general. He's going to stand before the Sanhedrin, the spiritual leaders of the nation. And we'll look at what that, who that group was, what they were made up of, and how the Apostle Paul deals with them who used to be one of them. He was part of the Sanhedrin earlier in his life before he was a Christian. It's such a great passage of Scripture. I don't want to rush through it in the next 15 minutes. <clears throat> I don't want to rush through it. I want to give time to it. We'll do that next, next Wednesday night. I'll be teaching and we'll go through that. But before you turn off the broadcast, before we go our way tonight, I think this whole story brings something to light. I, I just want to address for just a moment. The story illustrates once again that Paul had been designed by God to reach Gentiles with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would I say that? Paul thinks he's designed to reach Jews. Why is it exactly the exact opposite? Well, number one, because he was an expert in the Old Testament. Now, where you would think that would make him an expert to reach Jews, I think it makes him an expert to reach Gentiles for this reason. Most Jews in Paul's day just assumed God hated Gentiles. They, they assumed, as we talked about before, that God only created them for the fires of hell. You see what a group of them do when Paul just mentions that God sent him to reach Gentiles. That's so blasphemous to them, they riot and don't want to hear it. There was no love loss between Jews and Gentiles. And yet, you can't get that from reading the Old Testament. You can get that from culture. We can think of all kinds of things because of culture. But Paul wasn't just culturally influenced, he was biblically influenced. And because he was biblically influenced maybe more than anyone else of his time, he knew that's not true. The prophets Isaiah, the prophets Jeremiah, they, they talk about God have a longing for the Gentiles. Beyond what he could read personally for himself in the Bible, his mentor was pretty important, Gamaliel. Some of, the, some of the, 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 the writings we have of his disciples, this is what Gamaliel said that still existed today. Gamaliel was one of the only rabbis that taught God actually loves Gentiles. So what I'm telling you is from the time he was 12 years old, Paul, he knows the Bible and his teacher's telling him God has a heart for the Gentiles. That made him unique to reach the Gentile people as a Jew. Secondly, what we see in the story here. What made him unique to reach the Gentile people is he was a Roman citizen. He was from Tarshish. 
He, he was ethnically a Jew, but he was from Tarshish, a Gentile city. He was raised and educated in Jerusalem. His parents were Jewish, but, 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 but from being from a Gentile territory, he was a Roman citizen. And, and, and he watched his Gentile neighbors growing up, seeing their customs, and no doubt it touched his heart. And then when he got in trouble, not for doing anything real, but for preaching the gospel, well, Paul could just pull out his citizenship card. <laughs> And you realize, Peter, James, they didn't have that advantage. They would have sat in prison in Philippi for a long time because they, they could never say, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. But Paul had been uniquely designed by God for the calling that God had upon his life. And Paul knows that. Listen to what Paul says in, in, in various places of the New Testament. It says in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, verse will be up on the screen. So, I, so he says, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul knows who he is. He says again in 2 Timothy chapter 1, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul was an apostle to a Gentile, but being a Jew, he had a serious heart for his countrymen. Paul says this in Romans 9, he says, For I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. Dude, that's heavy. Paul is literally saying there, I would trade eternity and heaven with Jesus if it meant that all my Jewish brothers would be saved. That's love. <laughs> that's, that's love. I love you guys a lot. I, I, I feel so blessed to be able to pastor the Garden Fellowship. But one thing I've never told God is, I'll give up my heaven if everybody, I, I'm just, I, I've never said that. I'm sorry I haven't said that. I just, I just want to go to heaven. So I, this is love from the Apostle Paul. This is love from the Apostle Paul. What a passionate heart he had for the Jews. And you, and you see it in his ministry. Almost every city, every Gentile city that Paul ever came to, what would he do? He would first go to the Jewish synagogue he would give them a chance to respond to the gospel. And then when they wouldn't, and they never did, he would go to the Gentiles. You think about the church plan in Ephesus. We've just been studying over the last couple of weeks. He's teaching in the Jewish synagogue for three months. And at the end, people spoke evil of him and Christianity. And you can say, well, that's just Jews. They were just, they were just hardened toward the gospel. Let's not forget, a hundred thousand of them had come to faith in Jesus in Jerusalem. There wasn't something about being Jewish that made it impossible for you to become a Christian, especially in the first century before the 2,000 years of history of violence between the two groups had happened. Paul ministers for three months to these same Jewish people. For three months. Like, let, let's say you have an unsaved relative. How, how, how cool would you think it would be if I'd say, hey, I got nothing going on between, between, between now and October. I'm going to meet multiple times a day. Me, Pastor Jason, I'm going to sit down with your unsaved grandma and I'm going to share with her every day for three months. Wouldn't you be like, what? Now, that's just me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a heel compared to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, probably the greatest human that ever lived, is ministering to these people for three months and nobody gets saved? Nobody gets saved? What is going on? And yet we see that everywhere Paul went. The first time he tried to reach Jewish people was right after he got saved. He's in Damascus. He had gone there to arrest Christians. He got saved. And so what does it say? Well, I'll put on the screen Acts chapter 9 so you're reminded. It says, but Paul increased in all the more strength and confounding the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Paul gets saved, and he thinks, oh, I am the guy to reach Jews. And yet, as they couldn't poke a hole in his argument at all, Acts 9 tells us. And yet, a few got saved. One or two got saved. That's not what it says. It says they all wanted to kill him. They all utterly rejected him. And that would repeat itself every place he ever went. Instead of revival breaking out, riots break out. Then Paul says, after Damascus, he goes back to Jerusalem and seeking the Lord for what to do next, 
Paul tells us in our text tonight exactly what the Lord told him. Look at back at Acts chapter 22, verse 17. It says, verse will up all on the screen as well. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him, the Lord, saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. And the Greek is even more emphatic. It says, these people will never receive your testimony. These people will never hear you, Paul. And yet, you watch Paul's entire life in Philippi and Thessalonica and Ephesus and Corinth. The Jews don't respond, not in any numbers, and yet Gentiles do by the thousands, just as God said. And here in chapter 22 tonight, Paul once again just can't help himself. He reasons, he shares very logically with the Jewish mob. And yet instead of a revival, it's not the Jews can't get saved, 100,000 were. Instead of revival, he finds himself in prison for years. Paul's going to be in prison. It starts in the chapter tonight. It'll go two more weeks for us on a Wednesday night. It's a lot longer than three weeks for Paul. It is three years for Paul. And more than that, in that three years, though he will share the gospel a lot with a lot of Roman leaders. Nobody gets saved. No letter that's in the New Testament is written from Paul. It's three years of basically wasting time when Paul only has about six years left in his life. Half of his remaining life is, sit, is sat fruitless in prison. Why, why are you saying all of this? Well, as soon as he gets out of Israel... As soon as he gets out, people start getting saved on the boat. He's going as a prisoner. People get saved. He gets to Rome. He's put in prison in Rome, but he writes letters like, like Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, some of the greatest testaments in the, in the New Testament about who Jesus is. He becomes fruitful again. Why am I saying this? Because Paul had a heart to reach the Jewish people, but he was called to reach the Gentiles. And every time Paul fought against what he was called to do and did what he wanted to do it seems to me just my opinion it was rather fruitless in his life now whether you agree or not with my assessment of paul the apostle i know for certain that will be true of you and me god has called you and me uniquely gifted you and me to do certain things and i want you to think about it tonight what has god called you to do Oh, this is what I love to do. Not, not necessarily what you love to do. Sometimes those will merge. But what has God called you to do? What are you passionate about at the same time seem to be really gifted in doing? Because you need both. Listen, for example, I'm passionate about worship. I love to worship. Worship is, you would think is the Bible teacher. My favorite part of service would be Bible teaching. You know, that sounds very self-serving, doesn't it? I'm the one talking. This is my favorite part. I, I enjoy this part. I, I know this is what God's called me to do. My favorite part, though, is just to sit and worship. I love to worship. There's part of me that wishes I was called to be a worship leader. I really do. But in my mind, I would be really good at it. <laughs> in my mind. And yet, here's the thing. Because of my position, I've... I've been able to put myself in that role at times. When I was pastoring the church in Texas for, for a couple, almost a year, I led worship on Wednesday nights at the church there. And oh, it, it just seemed fruitless. I love it. it just seemed, it's, not, it's not what God has called me to do. I'm thankful my kids are called to do it. I'm thankful that's Jared's calling. But, but that's not necessarily what God has called me to do. I think of my pastor, the, my, my original pastor, Pastor Chuck. You know, hearing his stories about him being young in the ministry, he had a passion for evangelism. He really wanted to see people get saved. And so every Sunday would be an evangelistic sermon. And his churches were never more than, than 40, 50 people. And here's a guy that eventually pastored Calvary Costa Mesa with 25, 30,000 people that went there at one time. What changed? Well, God told him, hey, I haven't called you. I, you, you can do evangelism. We're all called to do the work of an evangelist but you're a teacher of God's word. So just teach my word. Just to start with Genesis and start teaching. And talk about more than 40. <laughs> you're talking about 25, 30,000 people who eventually become part of that church because he says, I'm gonna do what God has called me to do. And I'm gonna let the evangelists do the evangelism and let guys like Greg Laurie start doing evangelism on Monday nights. And I'm so thankful for that because... 
Maybe you know, maybe you don't. That's where I got saved. A Monday night at Costa Mesa with the evangelist, Greg Glory preaching the gospel. You see, when we run our lives, when we run our churches by saying, I just want to do what you've called me to do, but I kind of like this better. I get it. I get it. Hey, I, I, I want to be a worship leader too. Okay, great. Is that what you're gifting? No. People seem to riot when I lead worship. Well, maybe that's not what God's called you to do. Well, I, I, I know I'm called to, to prayer ministry, but I love teaching. But every time I teach, people riot. Well, maybe, maybe that's not your calling. And we can, we can argue till we're blue in the face about, I want to be able to have the right to do what I want to do for Jesus. Hey, let's not forget that your life is precious. Your life is precious because it has been bought by the blood of the Lamb. And when Paul tells us that in the Corinthian letters, he says there, therefore, your life is not your own. Because you haven't paid anything to save yourself, praise the Lord, your life in no way belongs to you anymore. So what is so natural for us as humans, oh God, I've got the greatest plan. Let me tell you about what I'm gonna do for you. And we do that, don't we? We tell God all our plans, then we say, God, would you bless my plans? And when he doesn't, we wonder what's wrong with God. How about, precious church, we take a step back and like Paul, who I, I know my whole sermon is based on him not doing this on occasion, but Paul started out by saying what? Lord, who are you? And what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What have you called me to do? What place have you given me in the body of Christ? And if we can jump on that and say, God, I want to honor you and I want to do what you want me to do. What's going to be the fruit of your life? It's going to be fruitful. I don't know numbers. I don't know how many. But it's going to be fruitful because you're right in the center of what God has for you. Jesus told his disciples, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke. Yeah, they would put these yoke on oxen that were made and designed just for them. they say, put my yoke upon you because my burden, it's, it's easy. My burden is light. And we read that and we think, I don't know if I agree with that. The, the, the calling of the Lord in my life, it's, not, it's certainly not easy. I, I work hard at what I do. Amen. That's, that's not what Jesus was saying at all. That's what it sounds like in English. In the original text, he's talking about the way that yoke would fit that oxen. It would fit well if the carpenter knew what he was doing. And guess who was an expert carpenter? Well, Jesus, our expert carpenter, has made a yoke for me and for you that isn't just sort of right. And it fits the way it is. And whether I'm speaking to you about, about marriage someday, whether I'm speaking to you about ministry someday, or I'm speaking to you about calling someday, God's will for you, it fits. And it's perfect. And I would encourage you, as I encourage myself all the time, because I'm I can be so like this. Oh Lord, let me help you out with this one. Just be faithful to be who God's called you to be. Just be faithful to do what God has called you to do. And what will you'll say is you'll say, man, this fits well. This is right. And we won't waste half our time in fruitless pursuits. Amen? Amen. God, we thank you so much for your word for us tonight. And I pray, however, however it applies, however we're, we're grappling with stuff, I, I pray that we would just take our issues to you. We'd submit things to you that are just sin and rebellion. And stuff, some stuff, Lord, in our life isn't sin and rebellion. It's just kind of a weight. It's a weight that we carry around that's maybe something we want to be passionate about, something we want to do, and it just is kind of weighing down our Christian life. And I pray that, that as, as the author of Hebrews says, that we would just lay down every sin and every weight. We'd allow you just to lead us and guide us every step of the way. Lord, your will for us, your, your yoke for us, it fits well. It's been designed perfectly for us. And so I pray, God, that we'd submit to you and just let you be God over every area of our lives, knowing that's where joy, fulfillment, and fruitfulness really comes from. Thank you, Jesus, for whispering these lessons and many others, I hope, into our hearts tonight. God, just minister to us as we close with this song right now. In Jesus' name, amen.